Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on spans and proportions of common spanning systems. We've been dealing with steel for quite a while. We're now uh, going into our fourth video, um, which we're labeling D. So this is chapter one, section seven, a subsection that we've created designated for steel. And this is our fourth video. And in this video, we're going to deal with steel arches, bow trusses, and domes. In other words, a whole series, basically, of compressive structures that uh, are, if not ideally shaped, close to ideally shaped for resisting compressive forces. So we can have arches, which are unbraced, and they have the potential to exhibit something called roll-through buckling failure and they have to have some thickness for that and then of course they have to have some depth so there's a presumption that there are buttressing forces here um, and basically that creates a bottom line for the structure along here and the rise of the arch is now that so in this case the rise is l over four and I think in this case it should have said L over 2, but there's no label there. So we're going to say it's about that. <clears throat> so the, uh, you don't typically want to do an arch uh, any shallower than L over 4. And typically if it goes much over L over 2, it ceases to be an arch and becomes more like a column. Um, but there are situations where sometimes uh, that's the appropriate response, but rarely. A uh, key thing to resist this roll-through buckling deformation, that which, which we've drawn up here, this kind of dishing in there and bulging out there, we need some thickness, and the thickness is typically the arc length over 80 for really shallow proportions, or over 50 for deep proportions. And the, the deeper arch is structurally more efficient, and so it tends to have uh, fewer problems in its uh, structural performance. So the thickness is somewhat uh, less. It's basically the arc length over 100 for really shallow proportions to an arc length over 60 for fairly deep proportions. So we have an example of what that looks like. This is the Broadgate Exchange House. It spans a city block from there to there with uh, 13 of these bays and uh, 10 stories all together in the depth of the arch is from there to there, which is about uh, the span over 2, a little less than L over 2, but in the right neighborhood. And again, the thickness of this thing across here is consistent with those guidelines that were shown in the previous diagram. In the case of this building, there are four of these arches, one on each facade, and then two interior ones. So those interior ones do create some obstruction due to these sloping elements passing through the space. All right, so next we want to talk about bow trusses. Uh, when we go to bow trusses, we can have shallower proportions because the top cord, which is the compression element, is better braced because of all these web members. So we can go from L over 10 uh, to L over 6. So if we had a 60 foot long truss, uh, the shallow proportions would be 6 feet deep. If uh, we had a 60 foot truss, the deep proportions would be um, L over 6, or in other words, 10 feet. And by the way, the uh, span, which is not shown in this diagram, but is shown in the book, um, actually goes up to about 700 feet. So these are pretty long span structures. And likewise, and typically, by the way, we'd only do that on something like a football arena or something where we need huge, unobstructed open space. Um, so let's go look at uh, a more common span. This is a, a very common double angle truss. Um, this is, in this case, the arc of a circle because that's easy to roll and form. That's not the, quite the ideal shape, but these web members brace it. Um, and so um, it's braced at this point and that point um, relative to up and down movement. Uh, by these web members. So you'll notice in this case that the uh, compression member for the top of a bow truss can be much shallower because the unbraced length is from there to there, whereas for this structure you get these long, smooth, sweeping buckling curves, which um, 
pretty drastically reduce the capacity of that member unless you give it some reasonable thickness. In the case of this bow truss, the top cord doesn't have to be so thick um, because it's braced often enough that the effective length is from there to there for buckling. The other thing you'll notice is the bottom cord, even though under gravity it's acting in tension, it's rendered as something fairly thick because this structure is so lightweight and it has some aerodynamic issues with wind sweeping over the top and causing suction. So in fact, this bottom cord member can go into compression under wind suction and therefore has to be rendered appropriately. Uh, the same is true of all these web members. Uh, these, these elements like that one and that one are in tension under gravity, but under asymmetric snow load or some kind of wind suction, they can definitely go into tension. The key thing here is the two main members under uniform load are that compression member and that tension member. And so there are two main members and two really crucial joints. And generally, these web members are fairly minor by comparison. All the web members here, for example, are single angle. Okay, so that takes care of uh, arches, which basically are bracing, they're self bracing through their thickness. Then we have uh, bow trusses, which the compression member is braced by all these uh, triangulating web members. And now we're going to talk about domes and network domes are self-braced um, and that any tendency to roll through on any part tends to be resisted by other parts. So here's an example. This is the North Carolina Zoo. This is the uh, desert environment, which is certainly kept desert-like by the fact that this is a huge solar collector. So when we look internal, these are sort of what we call radial ribs, which by the way is not the most efficient way to do this because there's a huge density of material up near the top. But when we get into domes, we'll talk in more detail about alternate ways of patterning. I happen to like the radial dome because I think it's just beautifully expressive with all those arch elements converging at the top, uh, but it is not structurally as efficient as it could be. And there are really interesting alternatives in the nature of small circle network geometries or geodesic geometries, which we can talk about in more depth when we get to chapter eight on compression structures. Uh, the key thing you want to note is how shallow these structural elements are. Uh, domes are unbelievably efficient because when this element wants to buckle through, it basically has these struts. So if this one wants to roll through inward, these struts help transfer the force out to the adjacent members. And as a consequence, the entire structure tends to be self-bracing. So Domes are among the thinnest elements that we can possibly have. And you kind of have experienced this if you've ever played with an eggshell. Uh, eggshells are fairly brittle and they break fairly easily, but considering how thin they are, when you think of what kinds of forces they're able to take and basically um, how, how resistive they are to any kind of deformation, it gives you a a real deep appreciation for how well a domed, a shell of a dome can work. Uh, here's another example. This is a structure where this portion is dome-like and that portion is dome-like, but in between, and by the way, this is a wide angle lens, so that's why these things look kind of curved, but this portion in between is a, is a vault that's supported by arches, and these arches have to be much deeper because they have to be self-bracing. Whereas these ribs are not totally self-bracing. They're relying on all this adjacent structure to help hold them in line. So for the domical part of this, you see much shallower elements than you do for this uh, center port portion uh, where these arches are not bracing each other. Uh, this is the Eden Project in Southern England. It's basically a series of geodesic domes which, by the way, have been sort of nudged into each other, or collided into each other, and then material removed. So uh, over here you have material carrying loads, say, all the way to the ground on the back side of this or on the front face. But the loads from this material and the loads from that material are arriving at this groove, and suddenly the dome has been removed there. So there has to be arch-like elements that are incredibly powerful along that line and that groove and these grooves uh, 
And because those are arts-like elements and not domes, we know that they have to have greater depth for resisting roll through buckling. So this, by the way, to give you a sense of the scale, that's a worker working on top of this. These are ETFE uh, pillows. They're basically two layers with air inflating in between. So it's an unbelievably efficient structure. There's no rigid structure over these 30 foot uh, uh, hexagons and this is what those hexagons look like uh, from the inside so you'll notice this is an unbelievably thin structure there is some tensile material on a surface further in that's adding to the effective depth but the the actual dome part of this is unbelievably thin and then you see these arch elements where the dome surfaces meet are much more deep and much more rugged uh, and this is just another view of that so here you have a thin shell of a dome and the thin shell of another dome. So here we have one dome and another dome and they're colliding at the center along this line. And that then has to be supported by this very deep truss, which is not only thick, it's like a girder, it's carrying lots of load and it has to be deep in order to avoid roll through buckling. That ends our discussion on, on uh, spans and proportions for steel arches, bow trusses and domes. And I guess I um, should go back and say one thing. I apologize for not doing this before, but you'll notice that the thickness for for domes is the shallowest is like the arc length over 300. The deepest is the arc length over 500. That's substantially better than for the case of this truss. And so we have a series here where for the bow truss, we have bracing that's fairly frequent and the shallowest sort of members there, which we don't even have a guideline for that right now because it depends too much on the loads. But then we go to arches and we got thicker stuff. But then when we go to trusses, uh, to domes, we get this mutually bracing effect again. So the dome surface sort of replaces the effect of these web members in the sense of it braces all the compression members and forces them to stay under the load. So as a consequence for domes, the structural compression members can be fairly shallow and in fact, or thin, uh, not very deep. So the depth of this uh, domical shell for this shallow rise can go as low as the arc length over 300. For this deeper rise, which is gonna be structurally more efficient, the thickness can go all the way down to the arc length over 300. Again, you may not want to go there for any of these. You may not want to go to this shallowest proportion or that shallowest proportion or this one or that one because that may not be the most structurally logical, but it gives you an idea of how low you can go. And basically, these domical structures can become unbelievably thin um, from a structural point of view. So. Again, that concludes our discussion of steel arches, bow trusses, and domes from the proportion, from the point of view of what should the spans and proportions be. So this is the end of our fourth um, video on steel spanning systems.